Okay. Um, so there are two uh, kind of schools or two types of methods in statistics. Um, one is called the frequentist methods. Another is the Bayesian method. Another category is known as the Bayesian methods. Now, um, they differ at the follow, on the following three aspects. And one is, uh, you know, what is probability? What is a probability? So, in the frequentist framework, a probability refers to a long-run frequency. So, it's some kind of it's an objective quantity. We can talk about, for example, uh, the probability of seeing a head if you toss a coin is going to be half. So, what does that half mean? That means that if you do this coin tossing ex experiments many, many times. And then in long run, about 50% of the time, you're going to see a head and another 50% of the time, you're going to see a tail. So that's what's the meaning of a probability. And also in the frequentist approach, when we see there is a parameter and the, any parameter is a fixed constant, it is not a random variable. It's just unknown to us, but it's a fixed number. And any statistical procedure will, uh, you know, when there's a probability attached to it, it actually um, means the long-run frequency property. For example, and um, when we say we conduct a, um, there's a type one error is five percent. That means if you do that hypothesis testing many many times under the null hypothesis, there's a five percent of time you're going to make an error, type one error. And uh, one uh, very tricky concept is the, uh, you know, confidence interval. For example, when we see a um, you know interval and um, is a ninety-five confidence interval, uh, what does that mean, right? Uh, so let me um, just run the exp and um, run a simulation in R just to explain and um, what is the meaning of a ninety-five confidence interval. Oh, feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions because we have a small group of students, so I can, I can always uh, stop in the middle. Um, oh, so I'm gonna stop sharing. And I'm going to switch to R. Okay. So I actually I have already um, prepared some R code. So um, yeah, let me just for example, if we have a sample, size, let, let me do this. So if you have a sample size and um, twenty, oops, and. Oh, okay. So if I have a sample size 20 and the true mean is zero, so we can generate, uh, you know, um, 20 observations and, you know, centered at the mu, right? Oh, R norm N. So, and then how we construct the 95 confidence interval for mu. Uh, it's just going to be uh, the sample mean and plus minus 1.96. Is that 1.96, right? Times the variance is one. So SQRT and N. So it's just, uh, let's see. Is that right? So this is a confidence interval for mu. Okay. So it's going to be, uh, you know, minus 0.4 to 0.4. So in this interval, it covers the, the true mean zero. And if I generate a different data set, you know, another uh, 20 samples, and I calculate the confidence interval, now this is going to be a different interval, right? And often in any in intro class, you will be asked to interpret what this interval uh, means. It's minus 0.5 to uh, you know, 0.4, if I do it rounding. So the question is, can you claim this interval going to cover the true mean with probability 95? That's a wrong statement because this is a fixed interval and the true mean is a fixed number. So this particular interval either covers that true mean or it doesn't. So there's no probability attached to that. So the probability should be interpreted as 
well, if I keep generating data this under the same uh, you know, mean mu, which is zero here, and if I keep calculating this confidence interval, then um, well, I know based on the way we construct the confidence interval, I know about 95% of the time, I'm going to generate a confidence interval that covers the mean zero. So that's the interpretation. But for a particular interval, it either covers or it does not cover. Um, we just don't know. <laughs> so for example, I run a simulation study here. I'm run 100 iterations. I generate my data as a matrix and I calculate the confidence interval. So I should get 100 confidence intervals. So I plot them. So okay, I'm just going to do the plot and just explain to you what I'm plotting here. And I think I got an error message. Yeah, it's minor. So here uh, you can see the true mean is, so there are like 100 iterations. The true mean is zero. Those gray bar will be the confidence interval, you know, lower lower, lower limit and upper limit. And I color those bars. It, it does not cover the true mean in red. So you can see among the 100 iterations, there are four of them, which is 4% chance. Uh, it, you know, I have an interval it does not cover the truth. So 96% of time, my interval covers the truth. So if I run this iteration again, I get another, you know, different intervals. And this time is there are like, what? I think one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's only 93% of chance, 90, there are only 93 intervals out of 100 covers the truth. And I do it one more time. So you can see, so for every interval, it is, because parameter is a fixed number, although we don't know here, I generate the data. So I mark the true parameter mu. But in practice, you would never know. You only see those gray bars. And we cannot say that in this bar will cover the true value with chance 95%. That's not a correct statement because it, it, it is a fixed interval versus a fixed point. It either covers that one or it does not. So the 95 is actually a long run frequency. So for a particular interval, we cannot see any probability. This is why it is not 95 probability interval, it's a 95 confidence interval in the sense that, well, because we know our procedure will eventually, uh, is, will always be correct 95% of the time. So we attach a 95 confidence on a particular interval, but there's no probability statement for a particular interval. So this is sort of the, um, you know, the free, in the frequentist framework and, Probability is a long run frequency and parameter is unknown, but fixed, it's not a random variable. Now, let me go back to um, share my screen. Okay. So, okay. So this is a, a frequentist approach. Now in the Bayesian framework, uh, things are different and on those three aspects. Now, probability is not no longer long run frequency. It's basically personal belief. It's almost like I can talk about what is the chance it's going to rain um, at 4 p.m. today, right? This is something it cannot be repeated. And we cannot talk about long run frequency, but 4 p.m. on this particular day only happened once in the history. Uh, however, because the unknown outcome, I can talk about, you know, the chance is going to be maybe 80% because it is raining right now and where I live. So that's probability is, is just reflect the personal belief. Um, then any parameter, because it is unknown, we can talk about, we can assign probability to that parameter. So parameters will be treated as random variables. So it's very different from the frequentist approach. And then how are we going to make inference about a parameter? And we can produce a distribution over the parameter, which you can find as called the posterior distribution to make our inference. Um, so let me just start with some kind of, uh, you know, the steps we're going to, uh, how we carry out a Bayesian analysis. And we're going to talk about the conceptual arguments later. So here's how you're going to carry out a, a Bayesian analysis or carry out a Bayesian inference. Um, you going to still, you have your data, you have a parameter, so this, you have a likelihood. This is the same as in the frequentist approach. We have a likelihood, we have data, we have parameter theta. Now, starting from step two, now you're gonna put a prior distribution over this unknown parameter theta, and then you can calculate the posterior. Why? Because um, once you have those two, 
you do a product that gave you the joint distribution of x and theta. And uh, here I, I, I'm going to explain my notation. And the p is just a generic notation for um, you know distribution. It could be a probability mass function, could be a density function. And here I could use p to also use p. Um, but sometimes, because um, a lot of our inference is based on the distribution over the parameter, so I'm going to just use a special note and symbol pi to denote a distribution over theta. So this is a so-called prior distribution over theta. And then because we have a joint distribution now, and then we can just calculate the conditional distribution of theta given x, because x is what we observe, right? So once we observe data, well, we can always calculate what is the um, conditional distribution of theta given x, which basically is equal to the joint divided by the marginal. Well, marginal is, um, can be computed by the integral of the joint, Oops, sorry, dx, sorry, d theta. So um, I'm going to erase here. So if I'm going to use the same note and uh, kind of a same notation, always use pi whenever I'm as a symbol, when we talk, whenever we talk about distribution over theta. So this is always, um, you know, if I do an equal here, is equal to the joint divided by the marginal and of which is a marginal and of x. So we have to integral over theta. Okay. So you're going to find out if you um, plug in the expression here. I take the same expression to a denominator, but the integral that will be uh, you know, this expression. So we have a prior, we can tackle the posterior, right? And next we're gonna talk about equivalent form because um, I'm just gonna say that, well, it's actually when you do the calculation, you can actually ignore the uh, denominator. Uh, instead, just to focus on, just do the product of the numerator, just calculate this. Now, the denominator for any given x, the denominator has nothing to do with theta. So the denominator, denominator only serves as a normalizing constant. So once you have this form, pay attention to all the terms involving theta, and you can, you can find out what is the uh, normalizing constant you need to make this one a proper distribution over theta, meaning integral is one. So um, this is why you don't, a lot of times you actually don't need to compute the denominator. For example, if somehow when you, when you calculate the numerator, you focus on the parameter involving theta, you get something like this, which is the exponential involving a negative quadratic term of theta. And then you can click and suppose theta here is just any real number. And you quickly realize, well, this basic theta must follow a normal distribution. And you can go back to find out what is the variance and what is the mean. So you can use this trick many, many, many times. This integral in the denominator, a lot of times you don't need to compute this, okay? And now, so suppose you already get the postural distribution and then what, what's the next step, right? A lot of times we don't know parameter theta, so we wanted to get some uh, you know, estimate of theta. So there are many ways you can do, because now you have a distribution over theta, okay? And then, well, you can, for example, if you wanna get a point estimate of theta, you can do the postural mean, you can do the postural median, or you can do the postural mode. And uh, well, this is, not, this is not a good example to see mode because we see, we're gonna see two modes. So let me, um, make this um, a little bit more, um, I mean, less confusing. So like something like this, then you're gonna find out if you look at the mode, then that will be this particular value is just going to be your, the mode, which is a point estimation. And if you wanna get an interval estim uh, estimation of theta, you basically just find out the two tails probability to be uh, 5%, and you can get 95 credible intervals. So there are many ways you can, you can, you know, grab estimates of, about theta and once the postural distribution is calculated. And I do want to point out the mode estimation is often referred to as a map, maximum a posterior. And it basically means, well, we're going to maximize this posterior distribution. Maximize the posterior is the same as maximizing its log form. 
Now, remember I said this posterior is proportional to the joint times prior because the, no, the denominator is a constant. In a log, when we try to maximize things, it doesn't matter. So maximizing this is equivalent to, uh, well, it probably shouldn't be equal, but equivalent to maximizing log of the likelihood plus log of the prior. Now you can see when you try to get um, the map estimator of a parameter, and it naturally has a one-to-one -one correspondence with the so-called regularization framework, or penalized uh, likelihood framework because this will be MLE and this basically is a penalty you put on parameter theta. So for example, if uh, theta is your um, normal, let's work with a particular case. For example, if um, here um, we're doing a regression analysis. So uh, if I do a regression analysis, if we use our ordinary notation that this will be y. So p of y given theta. Theta is basically the regression parameter. Let me use beta. Okay. If you take log, let's assume sigma score is known, right? So this one you can find out is rough. It's, it's going to be proportional to basically y minus x beta square. Uh, there's a minus sign. So, um, you know, if you just do MLE, then your uh, you basically it's just going to try to when you try to maximize this you're minimizing the residual sum of square. Uh, if there is a map estimator, so suppose you put a normal prior over beta, so beta is p-dimensional, so I can do this. My prior distribution is normal zero, um, you know lambda identity p. Okay, and then you can you can write down what is the um, corresponding and uh, you know prior in a log form. So you're gonna get something is very similar to so this part will be proportional to minus something times beta square because that beta square will uh, it, it comes from you know this prior. So you can see range regression can be viewed as the map of a Bayesian approach where we put just a um, independent normal prior on beta. And similarly for lasso, there is like a, the prior over pi and it's just going to be um, the so-called double exponential. So the, it's because log of the pi beta should be sort of a um, minus something beta. And so now you put in the in the exponential, you retrieve the original prior and you're gonna find out the, the prior over beta and it's just some kind of like a double X and if beta is one dimensional because they're all independent. So you have sort of an exponential decay and on both sides. This is often known as the Laplace distribution. So uh, a lot of this regularization and estimate estimator or penalized likelihood approach can be interpreted as a map estimator under some kind of a prior. Okay. And so we can see, you know, the Bayesian approach um, is related with something we have studied a lot uh, in this course. Um, your first res resistance to Bayesian inference might be the priors, right? So where do does one find priors? Um, it has to be, it is part of the assumption. You, you have to specify that. And we, you're gonna find out prior, um, a prior matters or, or does not matter in the sense that if you have, if your sample size N is large enough, eventually the influence of the prior will be washed out by the, the likelihood because how we get the posterior Posterior is always equal to, is proportional to likelihood given theta and the pi theta. Now this is actually can be written as a product over n terms, right? So the posterior distribution kind of proportional to a product of n plus one term, the prior is only one term and you have n terms from the likelihood. So you can imagine when n is really, really large, this will play the dominant role. So we say, um, you know, the prior get washed out by the data. And 
of course, uh, when the sample size n is small, and the choice of prior will matter, and but that's true for any method. And so you ideally want you to do some sensitivity analysis to see how the prior choice will affect your posterior or your inference. And of course, you're going to find out, and since we see the connection between macro estimator and the regularization, you could imagine you could introduce a some kind of a tuning parameter in your prior. And then it's possible maybe do a cross validation or some kind of empirical way to pick the choice of lambda based on the data. I mean, that's also possible. Okay. So uh, let's just start looking at some examples, like how you're going to use this and you know steps, likelihood, prior, and calculate posterior. Uh, a lot. Of, I'm going to give some examples. These are the building blocks of um, the Spadian analysis, meaning the calculation is usually very simple, and because they all fall into this so-called conjugate families. Let's first look at the Bernoulli example. So suppose we have. Our outcome uh, or observation is going to be a binary sequence. They are from, uh, you know, coin tossing n times. So those xi's will be either one or zero, means you either you see a head or you see a tail. And there are iid samples from a Bernoulli distribution with parameter theta. So theta is the probability of getting a head. It's a number between zero and one. Um, so how are we going to carry out a, a basing uh, inference for theta? And naturally, uh, without any information about the coin, we feel like, well, we're just going to put a uniform prior over theta. Because theta is a, is a um, number between 0 and 1. And well, we don't know. So maybe just any value will be po equally possible. So maybe put a uniform prior. Okay, So that means pi theta is equal to 1. Now, given this, let's calculate what is the posterior distribution of, of uh, theta. So here's how you calculate the posterior distribution. Um, based on the, uh, what we said before, um, the posterior, posterior is always proportional to the likelihood times prior. Oh, actually, already is equal to likelihood times prior. And uh, because, um, I should really, I should time the prior pi theta, but because this is just going to be a constant one anyway, so we can just ignore that. So I'm going to erase this. Okay. So what is the likelihood? Well, for each one of them, um, it's going to be either theta if xi is one or one minus theta if xi is zero, right? So if you um, put them all together, you can, because n of them, so you can just, it's equal to product of theta and one minus theta, but with different power components. And you just sum all the possible ones in this binary sequence. So that, that's good to the power in s, and the one sum n minus s will be the power components for this term, right? Now, we know pi theta is proportional to this, and the theta is between zero and one. And then you can, when you watch this, you can now pause this and Google uh, what is the density function for beta distribution. Well, I can actually jump over here. So um, here's what's it. If you have a beta distribution has two parameters. So this is a beta distribution is a distribution over a number, a random variable taking value between zero and, zero and one. So the density function looks like this. This is a normalizing constant you can ignore. To recognize something follows a beta distribution, you just need to um, first make sure the random variable uh, takes value between zero and one. And second, just to see whether the density function is a product form involving theta and one minus theta, and then you just go to find out the alpha beta parameter. So the alpha parameter will be the power component at the theta, but plus one, right? So if you go back here, you're gonna find out, well, if we know um, an, a density for a random variable taking value between zero and one and taking this form, then we should quickly conclude theta must follow a beta distribution with parameter alpha is s plus one and the parameter this part is this number plus one. 
Okay, so um, so this is we, we know the beta. So we calculate the postural distribution. Then you can find out. And then let's talk about how we're going to make inference with this um, uh, beta distribution. If you use uh, postural mean, it actually going to take this form. So you can Google the definition for beta distribution. The mean of this distribution is going to be this. And what is the mode? The mode actually, if it's mode, the mode of this uh, distribution is going to be S over N. So oops, I think it's S over N. And so you can see um, the mode correspond to MLE, right? Because how we, if we observe uh, Bernoulli experiments, there are S head, S of them as um, S trials end up having a head and N minus S ending up having a tail, then we know the ML is going to be S over N. Um, so the mode will correspond to the ML, which is not surprising because uh, the mode is the map estimator, right? But here we are basically maximizing the likelihood. So this should give us the MLE. Let's give us the MLE. Um, but the, if you use posture mean, that's not the same. So it's actually equal to this. Um, so uh, what this mean, you can see MLE is equal to the observed frequency of heads among the N experiments. But the Bayesian estimator is like, it is a free, some kind of frequency, but among n plus one experiments, because the denominator is n plus one. So what are the n plus one experiments? In some ways, like we have already conducted two prior experiments before collecting the data x1 to xn. In the two prior experiments, we have one is a head, another is a tail. So this is why for this n plus one experiments, our number of heads will be s plus one because your one is from the pri prior experiments, right? So you can see uh, interesting here, well, something interesting here is, um, although we feel like we have no preference because our prior is uniform, but implicitly, if you look at the posture mean, we actually have put some kind of prior knowledge here because we placed two prior experiments. One is a head, another is a tail. So you can see, for example, if we only run our experiment once and we observe this is zero. So what is the MLE? MLE will be zero because um, you observe zero out zero once in, 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 one, uh, in one experiment. If we observe a head, and the MLE will be just one. You can see this is um, very, very extreme estimates because um, it's easily make mistake because you know, even for like a P is a half, a theta is a half, you could see one outcome like this, but you can see your MLE basically determine if you want to use it for prediction, you basically expect in the future, all the future observation going to be zero. Here's all the future observation going to be one. But if you use the posture mean from this uh, uniform prior, and uh, you can have your, oops, your posture mean is just going to be, uh, let's see if it's this case, the posture mean, the posture mean is going to be uh, one over three. And uh, in this case is, um, will be two over three, right? So this is how you, um, how, how the kind of the, if you do postural inference, when you use the bathing approach, you can avoid having those very extreme estimates. Okay. And the, right. So um, you can actually, you, you can actually use um, you know, other priors, not necessarily a uniform prior, you can use for them a beta prior and beta alpha and beta and with this two parameter as a prior distribution over theta. And similarly, you can find that the posterior of theta will also again be a beta distribution with you know, the parameter change this way. So it's like you have alpha, beta, alpha plus beta prior experiments and alpha, you see alpha, ones. Now here, although I'm saying like alpha plus beta experiments, sounds like alpha and beta must be integers, but actually alpha and beta could be fractions, like any positive number, like alpha could be 1.2, 1.1, 1 
beta could be 0 0.5, or they are both like 0 0.001. Um, so the, we, for the Bernoulli experiments, we will say beta is a conjugate family in the sense that if my prior is from this distribution, my posterior will also from this distribution. And so you can just see how the parameter change once you and you know, parameter got changed with the data. So it's called a conjugate family. The calculation will be very, very uh, simple. Okay. And you can now extend what if we're going to see another discrete distribution where we're going to see outcomes, not necessarily just binary. We could have, um, for example, if we're talking, if we, if we randomly draw a card from an ordinary deck and of a playing card, then the possible outcome, they're going to be, um, Oh, okay, if you only look at the um, the types like spade, hearts, and diamonds and clubs among the, then this is going to be a categorical variable with four different outcomes, and you can similarly and um, we are going to talk about a parameter four parameters, they actually have to sum to one, and we can this is the likelihood, and then. We can also talk about if it's a uniform prior and what's a posterior. And so in for the multinomial, the conjugate family is an extension of the Bernoulli called a, a Dirichlet distribution. So um, again, remember in the beta distribution, the, the density function is just going to theta, a product of theta and one minus theta, and we have to specify what is the power component, right? It's just because um, you have theta, another outcome is one minus theta. Now, here's a very natural way to extend this to consider multiple outcomes. For example, if you have K different outcomes, we're just gonna consider distributions. They are like theta one to some power and you know theta two to some power all the way to theta K to some power, right? And those thetas are actually between zero and one and, and sum to one. So this is a distribution family called a Dirichlet distribution. And there, here's some just normalizing constant. And so if we parameter, for beta we have alpha and beta as a parameter. If we talk about Dirichlet distribution for K parameter, K outcomes, then you have to specify the distribution is determined by this power components. So the alpha denoted by alpha. So alpha is going to be a vector of length k. And so the Dirichlet distribution is actually a conjugate family for multinomial models, meaning you have a prior and your prior is from Dirichlet, your posterior is also from Dirichlet. The calculation is actually not that difficult to do. Um, okay, you're gonna see a similar um, pattern. So for example, if your prior are going to have like alpha one, alpha 20, alpha k, and you basically the posterior are going to update each of the parameter by what you observe, the number of cards in that category, similar to the um, Bernoulli case. And so those are all discrete. So another building block we often use um, for Bayesian modeling is a model we use to model continuous continue random variables, right? One of the examples will be normal. And so suppose we have n observations from normal theta and variance sigma square. So here's the parameters are mean and the variance. Uh, ideally, we wanted to know what is the posterior distribution of two of them given the observed data. Um, this distribution could be a bit ugly, and, but you can find out later, and once I introduce what is a Gibbs sampling, you're going to find out usually we only care about the distribution of uh, one parameter given the data and others, right? So we only need to know those. So let's look at this one. It's basically is talking about a normal model where we know sigma square, right? So suppose we have a, uh, we have x1 through xn. They are iid from normal theta sigma square. Here, uh, sigma square is actually known. So the only parameter is theta. Uh, in this case, uh, you're gonna find out by so-called sufficiency reduction, meaning uh, if we care about just the, the mean, it is enough to just to compress the data as just, I have only one observation, which is a sample mean of the n observation. It is from normal theta 
and a sigma square over n. Again, the parameter is theta. Um, so you can just sort of do all your inference as if you only observe one observation. Um, now, this is in this case, theta is a parameter. Okay, the parameter. So we have to specify what is the prior over theta. Okay. And as a you're going to find out normal is also conjugate of the normal family. So we're going to assume this follow a normal distribution. Well, it's here actually with mu zero, tau zero square. So, and those are numbers you have to specify. So that's basically this one, okay? And then we have to calculate what is the posterior attribution of theta given sigma square and, and x. As I mentioned before, let me just quickly illustrate this computation is actually very easy to do. So what you're gonna do is, well, the posterior of theta given I'm just going to ignore sigma square because sigma square is known. Given x or just given x bar because observing the nx observation is the same as observing x bar if you only care about n theta. So this is proportional to the likelihood and times the prior, right? Now, and so this is because proportional because eventually we only care about the distribution over theta. So I can drop anything which is a, is a if it's a constant, and I can drop any scalar. So for example, um, this should be proportional to, um, I can ignore all the variance part because they, they have nothing to do with theta. So this is e to the power minus a half sigma square over n, x bar minus theta squared. Everything is one dimensional. And two tau zero square, and theta minus mu zero square, okay? So those are the terms we care. And the other like one over square root of two pi, those terms that basically, no, we'll, we don't need to pay attention to that because they're um, because we're talking about proportional to. And now pay attention to theta. So eventually you know that with this product, this can be written as exponential there are some things that are quadratic term of theta. There's some number here. So you, you can immediately conclude that theta must follow a normal distribution. Then we can go by looking at those quadratic, those coefficients, you can find out what is the mean and what is the variance. And so it's interesting. Um, the variance, one over the variance is called precision. So for the posterior, the precision is a sum of the precision from the prior and from the uh, likelihood. And the, the posterior mean is going to be a weighted sum of the sample contribution and the prior mean you specified. If you really ignore, we, we think mu zero is zero. If you ignore this term, you can see, and the W is a number between zero and one. So the posterior mean is always a shrinkage estimator of the MLU, which is X bar. So this is how we compute the posture and the posture mean posture parameter of, of a normal mean. And similarly, you can do the calculation for sigma square. They're one of the main and uh, and prior or conjugate families are called inverse gamma, meaning one over sigma square is going to follow a gamma distribution. So we see sigma square follow a inverse gamma distribution. The comp computation is very similar in the sense that always play the trick and you know, do the, when you calculate the posterior, only look at the product and then drop any, any constant and just try to recognize whether the expression uh, as an expression of theta uh, falls into some expression of a, of a known distribution. So you can find it's actually from an inverse scan. Okay. So, um, well, here's something, and um, as I mentioned in, um, in that simple normal example, we have two parameters, mu and sigma square. And now what uh, I have to, I have to say something here. Let me jump here. Um, so in the Bayer analysis, often we have we can the parameter we want to do inference, you can decompose them into uh, blocks. So for example, for the Gaussian problem, which is the mean parameter and the variance parameter. And a lot of times the this the whole joint of the parameter 
given the data is not in closed form, or at least it's just you won't recognize it as any known distribution family. However, um, but the theta I given all the other theta and the data, those are actually in a very simple form. For example, that's exactly what we encounter in the, in the normal case. The parameter is mu and sigma square. So you can, when you um, calculate this, it's a very simple normal family. Sigma given mu and x is another simple like inverse gamma family. Those are easy to, uh, like we know how to generate sample from them. Um, but jointly, this given data, uh, you know, won't take a simple form. So, and um, so the question is: We know two conditionals uh, wouldn't determine uh, the joint, right? Um, but for our inference, those two are enough. We can use a so-called Gibbs sampling algorithm. So, uh, here's it. What's the I, what's the idea? We wanted to sample. Um, for example, we want to do any inference. And about you know random variables from this joint distribution x and y. Um, it is not a simple form, but hypothetically, we those it like these conditionals are in simple form. So what you can do is and um, you're going to actually generate your so-called Gibbs sampling samples from those as follows. So you start with x0, y0 as your initial data and then you're going to um, sample then you're going to sample x1 from and um, you know x given y0 because that's easy and then you sample your x2 sorry you, you sample your um, y1 from uh, you know y given x1 and, and then you um, move to your x2, y2. So basically, um, this one is sampled by conditioning on um, y0. Um, given y0, you can sample x. Given x, you can sample y. And given this one, you can sample this. So you can just kind of a, a, you know zigzag. So you can generate those um, fiber distributions. Uh, so apparently you cannot claim and um, each one of them uh, IID sample from this joint, but um, it's once it converge, it's enough to, if you want to know, for example, what is the mean of X, you can actually, once this converge, you can do an average of those samples. And so this, they are like MCMC algorithms and they produce this, those desired samples from the produced samples from the desired distribution after the so-called burning period, like when this chain converged. So in, in, in practice, you can just generate your, you use this algorithm to generate those um, sample and you drop those prior samples. And then you can just store, for example, you want to know the mean of theta one, you just average those, um, you know, theta one, here is X and, you know, from the, after burning period, you can average samples to get any quantity uh, you, you want to get from the from the distribution. So that's actually the, the main um, the main strategy people use is actually not based on analytical form, but based on this MCMC algorithms for, for Bayesian approach. Um, for example, in, in that um, okay, so that's so a very, very quick summary about Bayesian approach. And you have a likelihood, you have prior, you have a posterior. Now in practice, our parameter is always involving many, maybe quite uh, different components. So this one is not in closed form, but we can use, but usually you're gonna find that all your care is to calculate the distribution of one parameter given all the others and the data. It's like, I'm gonna calculate the distribution by treating whatever parameter as given, because it's the current value of the theta and the data. So this one you'll use in a simple form. Then you, what you can do is you can use MCMC to, um, to draw those samples. And once you generate samples from the target distribution, then you can come with, if you want to use posture mean or posture mode or credible intervals, those can all be obtained from those MCMC samples. Okay, so those are the sort of the, the uh, a very brief review on how to implement a Bayesian procedure. Um, 
Now I want to go back to the conceptual part just as an ending of this lecture and uh, just to emphasize what is the difference uh, between the frequentist and bathing approach because at the very uh, begin at the beginning it seems like the bathing approach um, comes with such a big assumption which is the prior right so where you get the prior um let's first look at i just want to point out actually in the frequentist approach there's also a big assumption that is hidden there uh what is the what is the hidden assumption so for example Let's just think about a simple case where our data are just binary. And we know we can you know, think about this to toying uh, tossing experiment, right? You just generate, you toss a coin, you're gonna one, you get X1 and you get X2 and go on. In the frequentist approach, we will say that, well, we're gonna model our X1 through Xn as IID samples conditioning on what is iid is actually conditioning on a parameter p this is actually very very crucial why for example if i show you and i toss a coin which is a head i toss a coin again a head again i run the experiment 10 times it's always a head then i will ask you do you think my next result like to toss a coin again the next result do you think that one is related with the prior results or not they should be dependent Naturally, right? Because if you see 10 heads in the prior 10 experiments, what's your guess about the outcome at the 11th experiment? It's very likely you're going to put a high probability that this is going to be a head again. And the reason that you feel that independent, because I mean, this, this description is not contradicting to how we usually describe um, Bernoulli experiments, because in there, when they see they are, I, they are independent because you have the conditioning on P. So suppose conditioning on the probability of seeing a head is P, conditioning on that, yes, then they are all independent of each other. But if you don't condition on that one, they ought to be dependent, right? Then, now the, then, go back to, then let's go back to think about what we are conditioning on. We're conditioning on P, right? So what is the meaning of P? P is the probability of long run frequency. That means what's the meaning of P is like, well, you have to toss this coin infinite many times. So P that by definition is a limit over N, right? That's the meaning of, of P. P is the long run frequency of this experiment. Um, so you can see, when we're conditioning on, that, that conditioning on P is so easy to say, but actually conceptually, that means you are conditioning, almost conditioning on the whole history of this binary sequence. Then they can, you can claim independence, right? And so just wanted to sort of point out in the frequency setup, when we see something is conditionally independent, you know, we get, bunch of observations are IID given P, it actually means a lot. It means you have the conditioning on almost the whole infinite sequence of this experiment. So in the Bayesian framework, it's, it seems a bit different. And uh, we can claim, we're not gonna condition on anything, but you only claim those XIs are exchangeable. And in order to understand this, let's, and, and let me just show you this expert. And this is a, show you this result. We can continue to discuss this on Friday. You probably have seen this uh, in some intro probability course. So imagine you have a jar, it contains, oops, let me just describe this. You have a jar and it contains um, R red uh, marbles and you have, and then it contains um, you know, B blue marbles, okay? So this is the initial point. And then you're going to, how are you going to generate a, a random sample? X, Y, just only take two different values, either red or blue. And so you're going to, somebody going to just uh, randomly uh, draw a ball out of this and you record the color. That's without loss of generality, assuming if it's red, you just X, Y is one. So what is the probability of this is equal to one? It's just going to be R over R plus B, right? Randomly. Now we're gonna do um, 
you can do, um, we're going to talk about, there are two different procedures. One is sampling with replacement, meaning you're going to, um, you get a marble, you record color and you put it back along with C new uh, marbles of the same color. So there are two interesting case, case we encountered before. If C is zero, that's called sampling with replacement. And in that case, basically you can keep doing this experiment and every time the chance of seeing uh, red is going to be this ratio. So they're all independent of each other. And if C is minus one, that basically sampling without a replacement. And we know that sequence X1 to so X2, you can only do this experiment R plus B times because at the last time there's only one marbles in the jar. But you could uh, talk about the case where C is not equal to you know, those two numbers. Let's say, suppose C is equal to two. So meaning at, at the beginning, you randomly draw a marble, you take the color, if it's red, then you're gonna put two red marbles back into this, this newly added one. And then you're gonna randomly draw one again. Now you can see in this case, the probability of x2 equal to 1 will be different. It's equal to r plus 2, r plus b plus 2, because you added two new marbles of color red, right? But this is a conditioning on your first draw is 1. But if your first draw is actually 0, if your first draw is 0, you're actually going to uh, put two blue marbles back, right? So the chance of seeing a red is going to be R plus R plus B plus two, because you still have, uh, you know, R red marbles, but uh, the overall marbles increase by two. So apparently, if you do this experiment many, many times with C equal to two, those sequences are going to be dependent on each other. Because you can clearly see what is the outcome for my second draw will depends on um, the value at the first draw, right? So it's interesting you're going to show that it's actually, they are exchangeable and they can be viewed as, later we can see, it can be viewed as a, as a bathing approach. So they are conditionally independent, um, but they are uh, not without condition, they are, they are dependent. Okay, so um, we can, continue discussing this case on Friday. Okay.